Hi, my name is Dr. Dave Clayton, and I want to thank you for tuning into this video. I'm going to share with you over the next 30 minutes or so the five most important principles of clinical nutrition that you're ever going to hear. And the reason why these are so important is that they have the potential to prevent or reverse most of the chronic disease that we see in the United States and other developed countries. I'm talking about high cholesterol and diabetes and high blood pressure, but also chronic diseases we commonly associated with kind of normal aging, chronic kidney disease, heart disease, Alzheimer's, osteoporosis, cancer, the list goes on and on. And the important thing is that even most healthy eaters don't know or don't see the importance of what I'm going to share. So as we go through it and we dig into these five core fundamental principles, you'll see that if we elevate these to the most important things in our diet, they have incredible power to change our health. And it really starts with that annual physical. When we get the blood pressure checked and the cholesterol panel, we get our blood sugars done, we get a report card on our diet and exercise program. And if those are abnormal and you're already eating right and exercising, it's not age and genetics. It's not outside of your control. It's that you've just got to focus on what really matters when it comes to driving these outcomes. So if you've heard this before that, you know, it's just about getting older and you've got to take the medications, I want to dispel that myth right now. For the past 10 years, I've been working with patients in my clinic, helping them put these principles into practice and seeing the amazing improvements in their health. I'm talking about throwing away one, two, three, four medications over the course of weeks to months. And I did it for myself too. The reason why I even started doing this was because in my late 30s, I developed high blood pressure and high cholesterol, and I didn't want to take medication. Uh, I knew most of my patients resisted taking medication, and once I was right there with them, I really got it, and I started digging in and helping them make the changes that I'm going to help you make today. So let's really take a look now at what are those five core principles of nutrition. Now, the first one is to eat a hunter-gatherer or a paleolithic or a caveman diet. And I know this has seen its trend and it's been popular and now everybody's on keto and before that it was Atkins and South Beach. But I really want to impress upon you during this video that all healthy diets, no matter which one you're on, they're really healthy to the extent that they get you closer to the diet that we evolved on. And I'll show you why. And when I first started teaching clinical nutrition, I thought it would be okay to just tell people, hey, listen, go on a more paleolithic diet and you'll see the improvements. And that's where we get the other four core principle nutritional principles because after following patients' dialogues and seeing that even though they were following that diet, they were still not elevating these other categories, these other principles to the importance that they deserved, they were not reversing the disease. So those are for paying attention to the sodium and potassium balance in your diet. This is hugely important for a lot of diseases, starting with hypertension, but then heart disease, kidney disease, osteoporosis. So super important to preventive health. Next is getting enough fiber. When we look at how much fiber we need, almost all of us, actually probably all of us, not even almost all of us, but almost all of us don't get enough fiber. And that has huge implications for the incidence of diabetes, uh, colon cancer, and other chronic diseases. Uh, the next is the amount of omega-3s and other healthy fats in our diets. We've got a lot more fat in our diet now than our caveman ancestors ever did. And if we get the right fats, we reduce inflammation and improve our cholesterol panel and our heart health. If we get the wrong fats, then we have the opposite effect and it leads to chronic disease. And the last one is getting enough antioxidants. And you know this doesn't play a role right now with your diabetes or your hypertension, but what it does is it's an amazing, powerful tool for reversing most of the diseases we get with aging. You see, aging is a process that antioxidants ward off or delay by giving us the ability to ward off the damage that comes with aging. And we're talking about anything from wrinkles and arthritis to even Alzheimer's disease or heart disease. So super powerful tool, and I'm gonna show you why it's so important. 
So let's start by digging into each of these in turn, starting with why the Paleolithic diet is so important as a cornerstone of good nutrition. Humans as a species have been around for about two and a half million years. And before that, our primate ancestors can date back up to about seven million years or so. And during this evolutionary time period, our diet was relatively simple. Our primate ancestors survived mostly on plants. If we look at modern day apes like chimpanzees or monkeys or gorillas, they're plant eat plant-based diets is what they, what they survive on. So that's the primate lineage that dates back, you know, anything beyond two and a half million years. And about two and a half million years ago was when humans diverged from that line. And in about two million years before today, we started adding meats to our diet and diversifying away from that nutritional composition that our primate ancestors had and developing the hunter-gatherer diet that's well-documented and well-discussed in other books on Paleolithic nutrition. And the Paleolithic period is just that two and a half million years of evolution where we went from being much like uh, the apes and the primates to being the modern humans that we are today. And over that two and a half million years, we've changed a lot. I mean, look at a primate in a zoo, compare that to a modern human, and you can see how much we have changed over those two and a half million years. Thinking that two and a half million years ago, our ancestors were identical. I mean, they were in the same lines. And, you know, if you think about the fact that we are what we eat and evolution dictates that we adapt to our environment, then you see that the nutritional composition of the diet for which we adapted makes us who we are today. And that diet may have varied a little bit when it comes to where we were, whether it was Asia or Africa or Europe, but regardless, it was all plants, it was all animals, it was what we could hunt and gather. And only about 10 million years ago, during the age of ag agriculture, did we ever start to add new nutrients to our diet? And the first one was, of course, grains. So there's a lot of great books out there on what grains have done to our health. And the fact is, is that, that we had never seen such a dense source of carbohydrates before in our history. And that's only 10,000 years ago. We have not had enough time to evolve and adapt to a diet that has a lot of grains in it. And as you can see from this chart, modern foods that are new additions to the diet, including grains, now make up about 75% of, of a modern diet. And this goes for healthy eaters as well. I mean, when we think about oatmeal or, um, or brown rice or whole grain pasta or wheat bread, all of those, while they would be considered to be healthy by most people, they're new to our diet and the nutritional composition is vastly different than eating plants and animals that you can hunt and gather. So dairy was another big addition. So if you think about your Greek yogurt and your milk and your cream and your cheese, so all of these are only about five or 6,000 years old. And then we've got processed sugars, we've got processed oils, and when you add that all up, it's 75% of the calories in most modern diets that come from foods that didn't exist only a few thousand years ago. So we've had two and a half million years to evolve and adapt to that hunter-gatherer diet, but only a few thousand years and exposure to these new uh, nutritional uh, additions to our diet uh, and we just, we just don't have the ability to adapt. And what we'll see is that that shifted the sodium potassium balance. It shifted the amount of fiber in our diet. It reduced the number of antioxidants and it changed the composition of the fats and the quantity of the fats such that we start to see a lot of the chronic disease that we do see today. And when we look at modern diets that we go on when we're trying to be healthy, whether it's Atkins or South Beach or keto, what we see is that 
you do get the health benefits because we start shifting toward that paleolithic diet of more uh, you know, wild meats or that nutritional composition that we get from the wild meats, from the plants, the nuts, the seeds. When we add in more fruits and vegetables, more wild fish and meat and game, then we start to shift that in our favor. And anything that gets less processed sugars and fats um, and grains in the diet is definitely going to shift. So all of those diets will work and we can see massive weight loss, particularly on keto. But what I'm going to share with you is that when you look at how they translate into long-term health benefits, the closer these take you to, to a paleo diet, the better off you're going to be. So let's look at the next important nutritional comp component, which is the sodium and potassium balance. So the sodium and potassium balance is hugely important to health. And the reason why this is, is the sodium potassium balance is perhaps the single biggest driver of high blood pressure. And high blood pressure is the most common reason that people see a doctor for common disease for chronic disease and it is almost it is probably the most prevalent chronic disease in the developed world about 45 to 50 percent of americans of any age have hypertension and when you look at people age 60 and older that number approaches 90 percent so what we see is that hypertension is perhaps the earliest indicator of an abnormal balance of sodium and potassium in the body. And then there's other chronic diseases like chronic kidney disease, heart disease, stroke, osteoporosis that are all linked to abnormal balance of sodium and potassium. So why is this so important? Well, the reason is that uh, your body needs equal amounts of sodium and potassium. It's one of the most important balances of electrolytes in our body. And the reason is, is that we use sodium and potassium for all of the cell signaling that happens in the trillions of cells in our body. And what we do is we keep all the potassium in the cells, we keep all the sodium outside the cells, and then that gradient gives us a great way to communicate between cells. Uh, so if you look at your last blood test, what you'll see is that the sodium is really high. It's probably around 140 and the potassium is really low. It's around four. And if we were able to sample the fluid inside a cell, we'd see the opposite ratio. We'd see very little sodium and a lot of potassium. So it's super important that we have equal amounts of sodium and potassium in our body. It's just incredibly critical to the way our body functions. And yet, if we look at an all natural hunter gatherer diet that our ancestors survived and thrived on for millions of years, what we see is that they got about four to even 10,000 milligrams of potassium a day. Fruits and vegetables and uh, free range meats are all super rich in potassium. And yet they have very little sodium. Our ancestors probably only got about five to 700 milligrams of sodium each day. And our bodies evolved on that. It's one of the reasons why we have such an affinity, a taste for salt is because, I mean, it was critical to our survival in an environment where sodium is relatively scarce. If we could find some, we wanted our body to, to recognize it and consume it. So that's why we have such an affinity for salt. And in that environment where we were getting so much potassium and so little sodium, we needed a way to filter out all that excess potassium and yet retain the sodium. We wanted to hold on to it. You didn't want to lose sodium. It was so hard to come by. So our kidneys, which filter our blood into urine, they were evolved over millions of years to work as a really great one-way filter. You hold on to sodium and you excrete potassium. And unfortunately, they didn't evolve <laughs> the opposite skill. So it's not like they're sitting there ready to filter out anything we throw at it. They've been honed over millions of years to work this one thing really well. And yet when we look at modern diets, almost everybody is getting way more sodium than potassium. In fact, there's a really great study they did across 52 countries, sorry, 52 communities around the world. 
and they looked at how much sodium and potassium we got. And out of over 10,000 people in 52 communities around the world, less than 1% got more potassium than sodium. It was exceedingly rare. So we're talking about healthy people, thin people, fat people, old people, young people, it doesn't matter. Whatever their body type, whatever their age, whatever their diet, they all were getting way more sodium than potassium. And that puts a terrible toll on our kidneys because they're designed to get rid of the potassium, not hold on to it. They're designed to hold on to the sodium, not get rid of it. And our kidneys do a lot more than that. They, they monitor our acid-base balance. They uh, excrete excess calcium. They, um, they, they monitor our blood pressure. So our kidneys have all of these important functions that are related to chronic, to our health and chronic disease. And we're screwing them up with all this excess, uh, excess sodium and not enough potassium. And the interesting thing is that your kidneys are really adaptable. They're going to try and hang in there, but over years, decades and decades, first is the hypertension, then it's the osteoporosis, then it's the chronic kidney disease, then it's the heart disease, then it's the stroke. So you see your body start to break down with all that excess sodium. And we can throw medications at it, but it doesn't fix the problem. And that's why these diseases just keep propagating. In fact, a really interesting thing is that most of the hypertension medications, the ones we prescribe for high blood pressure, work on the kidney. And perhaps the most commonly prescribed ones actually just help your kidney filter out more sodium. I mean, it is that simple. If we reverse this equation, a lot of those medications go away. And you know, the, it's hard to put a finger on exactly how much blood pressure reduction you're gonna get from this one step. Um, but in my experience and looking at the clinical data, you know, about 10 to 15 points isn't crazy. You could see that much blood pressure reduction just by getting this one right. Uh, and if, you're, if you have hypertension, check out some of the links on this page because we've got some great programs to help you apply this to eliminating the medications for hypertension and bringing your blood pressure down into the normal range without needing to take a bunch of unnecessary medications. So that's the sodium potassium balance and getting that right is a major, major step to preventing chronic disease as we age. So let's look at the next super important element of healthy nutrition, which is fiber. And again, this is something that very few healthy eaters are focused on. We think about carbohydrates and we think about fats and we think about calories, but nobody's really looking at fiber. And I'm gonna show you why that's so important. Let's start with what is fiber? So fiber is undigestible plant carbohydrate. So some of the carbohydrates in plants are the ones that we can absorb and use for fuel and store for energy for later on. But a lot of it is undigestible. And when it passes through the stomach, it mixes up in the small intestine. And since we can't absorb it, it acts as a mechanical barrier to the, to the absorption of cholesterol and sugars and other nutrients which forced our bodies over time, over millions of years, to become really efficient at absorbing all these nutrients because they had to get past all this undigestible fiber that was blocking the receptors and blocking the absorption. But then past the small intestine, that fiber serves as food for our intestinal bacteria, for all those healthy bacteria in our colon. And that in turn supports the healthy function of the cells that line our colon wall. Now, our bodies evolved over two and a half million years on a super high fiber diet. The best estimates for the fiber intake of our ancestors puts it at around 120 grams of fiber a day on the high end. And they get at that by studying what they call coproliths, which are fossilized caveman poop, and they can back out how much fiber was in our diets. And that's not a crazy number when you compare it to modern day hunter gatherers in remote parts of the planet where studying their diet, we estimate that they're getting upwards of 90 grams of fiber a day. Now, I usually coach my patients to get to 40 grams of fiber a day at a minimum, and then anything up from there is a plus. Now, what does this do for you? Well, let's talk about chronic disease prevention. So high cholesterol and diabetes both can be traced in part to low levels of fiber because we don't have that fiber slowing the absorption of these nutrients. So our bodies are super efficient at absorbing them 
and when we take away the fiber, the levels shoot up. So one of the most important ways that we can improve our health at the annual physical and keep our blood sugars and our cholesterol in range is to be getting enough fiber. And anything over 40 will start moving the needle, I promise you. But then when you look down the road, low fiber diets are associated with an increased incidence of diverticulitis and constipation and hemorrhoids and colon cancer and other cancers, heart disease. So when we look at the incidence of these diseases in our 60s and 70s and beyond, having a high fiber diet is one of the most important ways that we can prevent chronic disease associated with aging. And for most of us, we only think about fiber and increasing our fiber intake if you're constipated, right? We just think of it like a laxative, but the reality is it has benefits that go well beyond constipation. It is an essential component to human health. Now you might be sitting there thinking, I do get enough fiber, but I can promise you, you are not. If you look at studies of diets in the United States, for example, a study of 23,000 people put the average fiber intake at only 16 grams of fiber a day, a fraction of what our ancestors got. And the statistics on that show that very few people, in fact, probably nobody was hitting levels of 30 to 40 grams of fiber a day. So out of 23,000 people, almost nobody was getting 30 to 40 grams of fiber a day. And that really syncs with my clinical practice. So over the years that I've been following diet logs, I can only remember one person, one person who had over 20 grams of fiber a day before he got some coaching. And that gentleman, it was an outlier because he happened to have a lot of artichokes that day. And those artichokes were full of fiber and they kind of artificially bumped up his daily number. Um, but most people I'm seeing more like 12 to 16, maybe 18 at the most grams of fiber a day. And this can have huge implications for your health. So when, if you're looking for ways to increase your fiber intake, supplements is a good way, but then shifting away from grains and processed sugars and refined flours and getting back to an all natural diet full of fruits and vegetables is a great way to go. And if you're looking for some more resources, check out some of the additional resources on this page, because we've got a ton of additional information to help you reach these goals. So let's take a look at the next important nutritional component, which is omega-3s and healthy fats. So there's two really important fats in the human body. One are omega-3s, the other are omega-6s. And the balance of these in our diet plays a huge role in inflammation and our immune response, among other things. Omega-3s are metabolized into prostaglandins, which are anti-inflammatory. Uh, Omega-6s are metabolized into arachidonic acid, which is pro-inflammatory. And if we look back to our hunter-gatherer diet, our caveman ancestors got roughly equivalent amounts of both of these essential fatty acids. It makes sense, right? If you've got one that is pro-inflammatory, the other that's anti-inflammatory, you'd want to have a nice balance so that you can regulate your immune responses. Now, the unfortunate thing is that versus that one-to-one -one ratio that our caveman ancestors got, most of us today are getting about 20 times more omega-6 fatty acids than omega-3s. Uh, the recommended dose of omega-3s, so to speak, in a day that I give my patients is anywhere from two to three grams of omega-3s per day. And that's a real minimum. If you look at some hunter-gatherer cultures in extreme climates, you see that can be upwards of 10 grams of omega-3s per day. So two to three grams is totally reasonable and it's a good number to shoot for, but the average of biologically active uh, DHA and EPA, the two most important omega-3s, the average that most people are getting today is under 100 milligrams. So you're talking about 90 milligrams of DHA and EPA in their diet. And that's a far cry from two to 3,000 milligrams. So we've got a tiny fraction of the omega-3s in our diet that we used to. And it's one of the reasons why we see a higher incidence of chronic conditions ranging from high triglycerides, low HDL, which is your good cholesterol, all the way to a host of autoimmune and inflammatory conditions such as asthma and rheumatoid arthritis. And there's even some links with Alzheimer's disease uh, and other chronic conditions, heart disease, where 
if we shift this balance, we really see a vast improvement in our health. And when you think about how we define healthy diets, getting that right balance of omega-3 and omega-6 is hardly ever you know, something that people talk about, right? They talk about their carbs or their calories or, you know, something else. And, and it, it just doesn't translate to the health outcomes that we're looking for. So this is particularly important if you're in that category where your triglycerides are high or your HDL, your good cholesterol is low because a, a high dose of omega-3s either through supplements or through changes to your diet can shift that pretty dramatically. And if you're thinking about your long-term chronic health, getting this level of omega-3s is super important. Uh, but that's only one side of the equation. The other side is the omega-6s that are pro-inflammatory. I mean, we're getting 20 times more than we need. And where is it all coming from? It's coming from the corn oil and the soybean oil that have made their way through our diets in hundreds of different ways. Most grains are really high in omega-6, not in omega-3. So as we've shifted our diet in terms of processed corn and soybean oil, making their way into the food supply, and all these grains that have um, really shifted our calories away from plants and animals into grains, what we've seen is that balance shift in a very pro-inflammatory way. So what we want to do is shift back to that paleolithic diet, get rid of a lot of the processed unhealthy oils, and, and maximize the intake of omega-3s, either through grass-fed, uh, game meats, fish, or through taking a supplement. I take a supplement every day. I usually recommend it because no matter how disciplined we are, it's hard to really shift our diet away from farm meats to uh, game meats. It's, it's usually um, a challenge to do on a regular basis. So, uh, so super important to our chronic disease prevention and can really make a big difference on your next cholesterol panel. And the last one we're going to talk about is the uh, antioxidants. So this category is super important for preventing age-related chronic disease and making sure that you live a long functional time on as few medications as possible. So antioxidants are important because they're essentially the repair crew for the cells in our body. You see, Every day we're burning glucose in our mitochondria and turning that into energy. And just like our cars generate exhaust when they turn gasoline into energy, our bodies generate exhaust, so to speak, toxic byproducts of metabolizing glucose into energy. And that damage comes in the, or that, that toxic byproduct comes in the form of free radicals. Free radicals are these molecules with an unstable, unpaired electron, and they're just like little wrecker balls inside our cells. They can damage proteins and lipids and DNA. And what they're doing is they're constantly creating chaos in our bodies. And this free radical damage is implicated in multiple diseases that we associate with chronic disease. It's part of the reason why cholesterol plaques in the artery become destabilized and rupture, creating that heart attack and stroke. It's definitely important in the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease and age-related blindness. And it's also linked to a lot of the kind of nuisance problems that we see with aging. It's wrinkles, it's cataracts, it's um, arthritis. So the list of conditions that are linked back to free radical damage is almost endless. Now, our bodies evolve with natural defense mechanisms for, pre for, for preventing free radical damage. We've got enzymes like catalase or super, uh, superoxide dismutase, and these are part of our intrinsic repair crew. So these enzymes grab onto these free radicals before they can do any damage, and they stabilize them, protecting our DNA and our cells from being damaged. But those repair crews that we have, these uh, enzymes, really aren't enough. And over a few million years, we evolved a symbiotic relationship with plants to augment our own antioxidant capabilities. You see, plants are masters of antioxidants because they're out in solar radiation all day, every day. And if you think that we generate some free radicals from burning glucose, they generate a ton of free radicals by absorbing solar radiation. I mean, think about it. We go out in the sun for a few minutes, we get a sunburn, 
that's damage. Plants are out there all day, every day, no problem. So when we consume those plants with their really high doses of antioxidants, what we do is we incorporate them into our own defenses and we stave off that free radical damage. And when we shifted a lot of our caloric intake from plants to grains and processed oils and sugars, what we did was we markedly reduced the amount of, of antioxidants in our diet. And that has super important implications for preventing chronic disease, especially for the elderly. So when we think about at any age, what we want to do to live a long time free of disease on as few medications as possible, getting enough antioxidants is one of the most important preventive things we can do. And in fact, as physicians, a lot of times we'll actually prescribe antioxidants for patients with certain conditions like age-related blindness, knowing that that is one of the most important ways that we can prevent the spread or the progression of that disease. Now, where do you get these in your diet? The spices are the most uh, important way that you can get um, antioxidants in your diet. Uh, what I usually recommend for my patients is I say, get rid of the salt. We talked about that earlier. And instead of salt, use the spices to uh, flavor your food. And you'll rapidly lose that taste for salt that you've accumulated all these years and you'll start to appreciate some of the flavors in these spices like uh, turmeric or cloves, uh, mustard seed, some of these uh, spices that have high antioxidant potential. And then also adding in berries and brightly colored fruits and vegetables because these are also great sources of antioxidants. And as you can add more of these into your diet, you'll really be um, giving your body everything it needs to ward off age-related chronic conditions. So the takeaways here are that if you're really interested in moving the needle on your health, these are perhaps the five most important nutritional principles that you need to master starting today. If you can get your diet closer to that paleolithic diet, and I have a lot of resources to help you understand what that is and draw the connections so that you really see how that links to chronic disease, if you can really move your diet towards that paleolithic ideal and give your body the diet that it's uh, genetically engineered for, you can start to see massive improvements in your health. And then start to work on your sodium potassium balance, work on your fiber intake, work on your omega-3, omega-6 balance, and work on your antioxidants and micronutrients. As you do this, you're gonna see your blood pressure improve, your cholesterol improve, your blood sugars improve, and you're gonna feel better getting your diet back to what you're genetically engineered for. So if you wanna live a long time, free of chronic disease, throw away medications and feel amazing about it, definitely get started today. And again, check out some of the links below. We've got a ton of great resources to help you learn more and put it into action through uh, reading materials and email support and online coaching and pretty much anything you could think of. We've been doing this for about 10 years now, working with dozens and hundreds of people, helping them really move the needle on their health. So I thank you for watching this video and I'll see you in the next one.